So, good evening, everyone. Uh, please welcome to our Sahasra ENT Foundation uh, for webinar on lateral skull based uh, malignancy by Dr. Kaveri Kapoti. And uh, I am very happy to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Kaveri Kakati, whom I had the pleasure of working. So, she did her MS ENT from uh, Gohati Medical College in 2014. And uh, followed that, she did her fellowship in head and neck oncology from Biborwa Cancer Institute, Gohati where I associated with her uh, for two years. And following that, she did her skull-based fellowship from uh, Tata Memorial Hospital in 2017. And presently, she is working as an assistant professor in head and neck oncology in our B. Barua Cancer Institute. And uh, she is right now a consultant uh, in head and neck as well as skull-based uh, departments in BBC. So with those words, uh, I want to welcome Dr. Kaveri to our webinar series. Uh, so kindly please take over and uh, Dr. Kishore will be uh, hosting and coordinating the meeting from now on. Thank you. Please carry. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the Sahasra ENT Foundation for giving me this opportunity to uh, share my experience on the lateral skull based malignancies. So coming to uh, the presentation uh, today. Um, at the onset, I would like to give a, a brief introduction on the skull-based tumors as a whole. Skull-based tumors are a rare group of disease which remains in close proximity to various vital structures. The routes of spread are determined by the complex anatomy of the cranio-maxillofacial compartment. And hence, uh, skull-based surgery is a highly specialized set of surgical procedures performed to treat various conditions that affect the skull base. Uh, the skull base anatomy is very complex and uh, poses a surgical challenge for both the head and neck surgeons and the neurosurgeons alike. It forms the floor of the cranial cavity and separates the brain from the other facial structures. Uh, five bones mainly make up the skull base. These are the ethmoid, the sphenoid, the occipital bones, the paired frontal and the paired temporal bones. Uh, skull base can be divided into three regions, that is the anterior, middle, and posterior cranial fossa. And this classification was uh, forwarded by Jones and his group in 1987. Uh, the anterior skull base, it extends from the posterior wall of the um, frontal bone to the uh, anterior clinoid process. It is mainly formed by the frontal bone the central part is formed by the uh, cribriform plate, the ethmoids, uh, which has the cribriform plate through which the olfactory nerves passes. The central skull base extends from the greater wing of sphenoid to the clivus. Majority part is formed by the sphenoid bone. The body of the sphenoid forms the uh, central part of the middle skull base. And it houses the cella tarsica, which is the seat for the pituitary. The important foramina in this region are the foramen rotundum, foramen ovelli, the superior orbital fissure, and the carotid canal. The posterior skull base uh, is mainly formed by the occipital bone. Anteriorly, it is limited by the um, clivus and laterally by the petrous temporal bone. Coming to lateral skull base malignancies, which is the topic for today's discussion, the primary malignancies of the lateral skull base, including the tumors of the temporal bone, are a rare group of tumors and accounts for just 0.2% of all the head and neck cancers. It is a complex anatomical region in which a variety of pathological entities like congenital lesions, the traumatic lesions, inflammatory lesions, vascular pathologies, as well as tumors which can be both benign and malignant, may be encountered. Uh, the lateral skull-based tumor management is a young discipline, which has seen tremendous evolution in the last 20 years. However, it is technically challenging, and hence a working knowledge of the normal, as well as the variant anatomy, is important for better or proper surgical management of this group of tumors. The lateral skull base comprises of the following bones that is the squamous and the mastoid portion of the temporal bone, the sphenoid, the occipital bone, 
the styloid process and the zygometric arc. For better understanding and evaluation of the sculbus lesions, Irish and his group in 1994 uh, came up with a classification after proper evaluation of the skull base malignancies. And they divided the skull base into region one, region two, and region three. Region one mainly comprises the anterior cranial fossa. However, it also includes the clivus and the foramen magnum. Region two includes the infratemporal fossa and the pterygopalatine fossa and some portion of the middle cranial fossa. And region three um, includes the posterior uh, ear, the temporal bone, and the possible tumor extension to the posterior, tumor, uh, posterior cranial fossa or the middle cranial fossa. So the region two and the region three of this Irish classification arbitrarily is defined as the lateral skull base. As already discussed, the region two extends from the posterior wall of the orbital bone or uh, posterior wall of the orbit to the petrous part of the temporal bone. It is formed by the infratemporal and the pterygopalatine fossa and some overlying part of the middle cranial fossa. And the important structures which are encountered here are the internal carotid artery, the facial nerve, eighth nerve, and V2 and V3 division of the trigeminal nerve. Region 3 is located mainly in the posterior cranial fossa and also includes the posterior segment of the middle cranial fossa. The vital structures in this region are the internal jugular vein, the sigmoid sinus, and the lower cranial nerves, that is the 9, 10, 11, 12 nerves. This is the pictorial uh, depiction of the lateral skull base. Various structures are related to this uh, region, that is the pinna, the ear canal, the middle or the inner ear, the vestibule cochlear nerve bundles, the facial nerve, the internal carotid artery, the sigmoid sinus, the CP angle tumors, the CP angle, the middle fossa, the parotid, and the pathology can uh, arise from any of the structures and involve the lateral skull base. It is also closely related to some critical structures like the cerebellum, the posterior cranial fossa, the cavernous sinus, the sphenoid sinus, and the lower cranial nerves. This is the bony subunits of the lateral skull base. Coming to the pathological conditions, um, the site of origin of this lateral skull base lesions can be from the extracranial structures like the skin and soft tissue or the connective tissues. It can be from the skull base bone or the cartilage, or it can be from the intracranial structures like the meninges, the blood vessels or the cranial nerves. They can be benign tumors like the glomus, the meningiomas, the schwannomas, or it can be malignant lesions like those are originating from the temporal bone or the infratemporal fossa. Usually we see squamous cell carcinomas there. It can arise from the parotid gland, that is the salivary gland histologies are found there. And it can rise from the uh, scalp, which usually gives rise to basal cell carcinomas. Coming to the temporal bone malignancies, these are rare tumors with a prevalence reported at one per million. The ear canal and temporal bone have various structures like the skin, the sebaceous glands, the bone, the blood vessels, the cartilage, and any of this can give rise to the structures. The structures in the vicinity also encroach on this temporal bone like the parotid or the mandible or the temporomandibular joint or the lesions of the temporal bone can also involve these structures in the vicinity. The mean age group to be affected are uh, between fifth to seventh decade. Uh, the cause of temporal bone malignancy still remains an enigma. One of the causative factors is found to be the chronic separative otitis media, that is the CSOM. Although no robust evidence exists uh, to prove the same, but maybe the chronic irritation due to this infections may have some carcinogenic potential. The next etiological factor put forward is uh, exposure to radiation. Tumors of the temporal bone are well documented sequelae of radiation given for various reasons like the nasopharyngeal cancers, the lymphomas, the scalp tumors, etc. And the mean time frame uh, from the radiation exposure to the tumor manifestation is found to be between uh, 5 to 30 years. 
the most common histology here is found to be squamous cell carcinoma. However, other histologies like the uh, Merkel cell carcinomas, the uh, Merkel cell carcinomas, the adeno uh, adenoid cystic carcinomas, the adnex cell carcinomas are also found. Uh, the temporal vein malignancies can uh, spread to its vicinity via various routes. It can spread anteriorly to the temporomandibular joint or the glenoid fossa or the ITF via the foramen of Hashki or the fissures of Santorini. It can spread inferiorly to the stylomastoid foramen and involve the facial nerve or to the jugular foramen to involve the lower cranial nerves. It can spread medially to involve the uh, tympanic membrane, to involve the middle ear and inner ear, and can give rise to uh, hearing problems or uh, vestibular symptoms. It can spread superiorly via erosion of the tegment tympani and extend to the middle cranial fossa. And it can spread posteriorly through the mastoid air cells to involve the posterior cranial fossa. This is a picture of the various routes of spread of the temporal bone malignancies. Uh, coming to the regional spread, the nodal metastasis uh, at presentation is found to be below 10% and the first echelon nodes is found to be the intraparotid nodes. However, as in all head and neck cancers, the nodal involvement is considered to be a bad prognostic factor with the disease-free survival dropping from almost 60% to 30% with nodal involvement. The distant spread is rare, and if involved, it goes to the lung, the bone, and the liver. Um, as there is no standard AJCC or the UICC staging system for the temporal bone tumors, we usually follow the modified Pittsburgh staging system put forward by Moody et al. for all practical reasons. Here in this staging system, the T1 includes the tumors limited to the ear canal without bony erosion or any evidence of soft tissue involvement. The T2 tumors are those with limited external auditory canal erosion, that is not full thickness erosion, or limited, that is less than 0.5 centimeter soft tissue involvement. T3 tumors are those which erodes the osseous bone of the ear canal, that is full thickness bone erosion with limited soft tissue involvement, or the tumors which involve the middle ear and the mastoid, and the T4 tumors are those eroding the coctea, the petrous apex, going extratemporal to involve the parotid, the jugular foramen, the dura with extensive soft tissue involvement and with evidence of facial paresis. The N and the M stage are similar to the uh, AJCC classification. So clinical features of lateral skull-based tumors, uh, they come with a variety of signs and symptoms However, late presentation in the temporal bone tumors is not an uncommon phenomenon. They can present with ear canal mass, ear discharge, hearing problems, facial palsy, facial numbness due to involvement of the trigeminal nerve. They can come with a vague fullness in and around the zygoma, the temporal area due to involvement of the infratemporal fossa. They can come with a localized pain of the trismus or they can have ataxia or the change of voice, difficulty in swallowing, headache, which might indicate, uh, which might indicate a intracranial extension. How to evaluate the lateral skull-based tumors? History is the most important uh, tool in the evaluation because it can give us a um, preliminary idea about the site of origin, depending upon the predominant symptoms and the structures involved. Uh, we then do the physical evaluation, which includes the otoscopic evaluation, a thorough head and neck examination, audiometric evaluation, vestibular examination, speech and swallowing assessment, neurological evaluation, and a vascular evaluation, like a pre-operative carotid artery assessment or the venogram, depending on the cases and the structures involved. Coming to the imaging, uh, a contrast-enhanced CT scan is usually done for bony details, and an MRI is usually done to assess the soft tissue delineation. Usually, CT scan and MRIs are complementary, but in limited disease where the tumor is just a T1 or a limited T2 that is involving just the ear canal without bony erosion, 
then only CT scan might suffice. However, if there is extensive involvement with uh, bone erosion or extratemporal extension, then MRI has to be done for a soft tissue delineation as well. Uh, apart from this, sometimes we might need to do a balloon occlusion test or a venogram, depending whether the carotid artery or the uh, sigmoid sinus is involved, in case these structures need to be resected. PET CCT scan is done in advanced tumors to rule out distant metastasis. This is the bony erosion in a temporal bone malignancy, the facial nerve squanoma, and the CP angle tumors. Biopsy is the most important um, examination to go forward with any treatment plan. Uh, they can arise from skin cancers or the parotid tumors, infratemporal fossa tumors, or the temporal bone. To plan any treatment schedule, the performance status, that is the general condition of the patient, and the disease status, that is the site, size, and the histology of the disease, is quite important. If we plan a curative intent treatment, then a thorough investigation, that is the preoperative evaluation or a pre CTRT evaluation, has to be done. We proffer referrals to audiologist, speech and swallowing therapist, and a nutritionist is important. However, if you plan a palliative intent treatment, then it will depend upon the general condition. If the condition, general condition is low or poor, then just counseling and asymptomatic care is given. However, if it is an advanced unresectable tumor, but the patient has a good general condition, then we can uh, advise the patient a radiation or a chemotherapy, but with a palliative intent. All said and done, skull-based tumor management is always a teamwork with representatives from various disciplines like the head and neck surgeons, the neurosurgeons, the plastic surgeons, radiation oncologists, medical oncologists, pathologists, radiologist, endovascular interventionists, etc., are required for proper management of this rare group of tumors. Coming to the management, there are three management, that is the surgery, the radiotherapy, and the uh, chemotherapy. The goal of surgery is, like in all other cancers, to remove the disease, to achieve a negative margin, and to minimize the morbidity or the mortality. The surgical decision depends on the characteristics of the lesion, that is the site or the size. Histology of the uh, disease is very important. If it is a chemosensitive tumor, then maybe we can just give chemotherapy to the patient or a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. However, in aggressive tumors like squamous cell carcinoma with extensive involvement, sometimes uh, surgery may not be worth doing, but with a similar extension, but with a lesser indolent, uh, or a lesser aggressive tumor or an indolent histology like the adenoid cystic carcinoma, we can attempt surgery even with an extensive involvement. The exposure and the excess needed is also important for a surgical decision. And the degree of morbidity which is accepted to achieve the goal also comes into a surgical decision or a planning. The proper incision planning and an adequate surgical approach can go a long way in reducing the post operative morbidity. Uh, well-placed skin incision uh, gives a good skin flap and a proper vascularity of the skin and a proper surgical approach gives a good access to the lesion. So a properly placed skin incision and a surgical approach is very important. Various incisions are the approaches that we usually uh, use in a lateral skull-based surgeries. Um, the preauricular incision, which is given anterior to the tragus, it can extend, uh, it can be extended um, below to access the neck or above to access the middle cranial fossa. The second is the uh, post auricular C incision. This is the workhorse incision, and um, various surgical procedures like the lateral temporal bone resections, the subtotal temporal bone resections, the trans labyrinthine approaches the trans cochlear approaches, et cetera, are usually done using this incision. Another point of discussion is whether to use a post-auricular C incision or a Y incision. Um, the post-auricular C incision gives a, a proper exposure or equal exposure to the mastoid as well as to the parotid, 
or the temporomandibular joint or the mandible by anterior extension of the pinna after freeing the ear canal. However, the Y incision, when we give, we usually give the anterior arm to access the parotid and the posterior arm to access the mastoid. By doing this, we might endanger the um, vasculature of the pinna because as we know, the vascular supply of the pinna is from the superficial temporal system and uh, post-auricular arterial system, which forms a plexus and forms the pinna. So if we give both the arms of this Y incision, then the vasculature of the pinna is endangered and might carry a risk of pinna necrosis. However, with a post-auricular C incision, without giving this anterior arm, we can have an equal and good exposure of the mastoid as well as uh, the parotid and the TMJ. Hence, nowadays, we do not usually use the Y incision and use the posterior C incision. So this is the posterior C incision and the ear canal incision. After anterior retraction of the pinna and freeing the ear canal, we can give we can get a very good exposure of the parotid as well with just the posterior C incision. The next is the COZ approach, that is the cranio orbito zygomatic approach. The incision extends from uh, anterior to the tragus, from the root of the zygoma up to the midline behind the hairline. This gives a good access to the supraorbital rim, the zygoma, and causes minima, uh, minimal brain attraction because it gives a good access to the temporal lobe as well. The next is the FISH ITF approaches. This was put forward by uh, Hugo Fish. It uh, gives an access to the ITF, the petrous apex, and the clivus. And, uh, Various structures in this region can be accessed via this approach. Uh, a pre-auricular uh, pre incision or a post-auricular incision, depending upon the structures to be exposed or accessed, uh, depending on that, we can give the incision. The next is the facial translocation approach that was put forward by Ivogenica. Um, and it has undergone uh, various evolutions since then. It was first put forward in 1995. This uh, gives a good versatility and a wide exposure. It permits greater versatility and a wide exposure at the skull base because of its modular design. And uh, because of the modular design, the facial, the repositioning of the facial subunits gives a very good aesthetic as well as a functional outcome. The posterior extended facial translocation module, it incorporates the ear, the temporal bone, and the posterior cranial fossa, and hence tumors existing in this region can be approached by this module. So various surgical procedures of a temporal bone malignancies, the extent of resection for the temporal bone malignancies will depend on the stage of the tumor and the extent of the disease. There are three conventional temporal bone resection surgeries, that is the LTBR, the lateral temporal bone resection, the STBR, the subtotal temporal bone resection, and the TTBR, that is the total temporal bone resection. So what is LTBR? This resection procedure is appropriate for limited disease, that is T1 and T2 tumors, and these includes resection of the ear canal, the tympanic membrane, the malleus, and the incus bone. The boundaries of resection are medially the middle ear cavity and the stapes, posteriorly the mastoid cavity, superiorly the epitympanum and the zygomatic root, anteriorly the TMJ capsule, and inferiorly the medial tympanic ring or the ITF. STBR, that is the subtotal temporal bone resection, is usually performed when there is invasion medial to the tympanic membrane or the tumor has extended to the mastoid. That is, it is a T3 disease. This specimen includes the LTBR with additional dissection of the otic capsule and the medial bony wall of the middle ear and the mastoid. The boundaries of resection will be posteriorly the sigmoid sinus and the posterior fossa dura, superiorly the middle fossa dura, anteriorly the internal carotid artery, inferiorly the jugular bulb, and medially the petrous apex. The TTBR, that is the total temporal bone resection, is a very morbid surgery, and these are usually designed to address the T4 disease. It includes 
performing an STBR with an additional resection of the petrous apex. The sigmoid sinus, the jugular vein, the internal carotid artery, the dura, and the cranial nerves are all removed as indicated by the extent of the tumor. This is associated with significant morbidity and hence may not be worth resecting because it also do not significantly improve survival in such an advanced cases. So this is the limit of the LTBR. This is for the STBR and this is that is removal of everything including the internal carotid artery is the TTBR. Coming to the treatment protocol for the lateral skull, uh, temporal bone malignancies, the LTBR is the minimum surgery that needs to be done in any temporal bone malignancies. Uh, the T1, in T1 tumors, only surgery is sufficient. In T2 tumors, surgery followed by adjuvant radiation. And in T3 tumors, surgery along with superficial parotidectomy and a level two sampling in case of a clinically N0 neck followed by post-op radiation or chemo radiation. In unresectable T4 tumors, we go ahead with a definitive chemo radiation, provided the general condition is good. However, if a disease is T4 on the basis of anterior extension to the parotid or the TMJ, then they carry a good prognosis and hence in those tumors, we can attempt surgery followed by post-op radiation. Another point of discussion is end block resection versus piecemeal resection. End block resection of STBR or the TTBR specimen involves considerable morbidity and piecemeal resection removes the tumor bit by bit as if chasing the disease until normal tissue is encountered. There is a current trend which is gradually shifting from end block resection to piecemeal resection because of the technical challenge with the end block resection as well as a greater morbidity involved with the end block resection. Various studies are there where they have performed piecemeal resections with uh, very less uh, post-op morbidity and almost equal survival rates. The Dean et al have performed the modified STVR which consisted of LTBR along with local excision of the involved portions of the temporal bone with aggressive skull base drilling through the tumor involved area and methodological re-excision until negative margin is achieved. The treatable versus non-treatable tumors. Treatable tumors are those uh, that are T1, T2 or T3 tumors. And among the T4 tumors, those with anterior extension or the preauriculate soft tissues are surgically resectable. Non-treatable, that is non-resectable or not worthy to treat, that is are those with significant posterior, medial or superior extension, the inner ear involvement, the gross brain involvement or metastatic disease. Coming to the management of the neck, in a clinically N0, we usually do not go forward with a prophylactic neck dissection. However, in T3 or T4 tumors, we usually do a superficial parotidectomy and send the level two for sampling to see for any uh, occult metastasis. And in a clinically N plus neck, we go for a modified neck dissection. The occult nodal metastatic rate is 15 to 17%. As already said, nodal metastasis is a known indicator for poor prognosis with the disease-free survival dropping from almost 60% in the node negative neck to 33% in the node positive neck. Uh, role of radiation in a temporal bone malignancy. In a T1 tumor, a single modality uh, treatment is used, that is surgery versus radiation. However, in a five years overall survival is found to be better with surgery as compared to radiation alone. In T2, T3, T4 tumors, we usually go for surgery followed by adjuvant radiation or chemo radiation. Um, Definitive CTRT versus surgery followed by radiation in advanced tumors, it is found that surgery followed by radiation is better than definitive CTRT. However, in cases where we can't resect the tumors because of extensive involvement, we can still give definitive CTRT uh, rather than making it palliative because the figures of definitive CTRT is also not that bad. The five years overall survival is 43%. So if the general condition is good and the patient is not 
resectable, then we can still go ahead with definitive CTRT rather than making it a palliative case. There is no standard chemotherapy regimen till date except for chemosensitive tumors like sarcomas. Um, various chemotherapeutic regimens have been used or tried. Uh, there was a paper from the Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, where they had used the TPF regimen as a new adjuvant chemotherapy, and they found that 50% of unresectable cases have turned resectable with this regimen. Uh, concurrent chemoradiation has been also tried with the TPF regimen, and the five years disease specific survival has been found to be 78%. But these are just trials, or these are just um, solitary papers, and it has not come into the uh, guidelines. So the prognostic indicators of a temporal bone malignancy, the tumor histology is important, the T stage is important. It has been found in the SEER database that T1, T2 disease versus T3, T4 disease, the survival is quite, quite significant with the P value being less than 0 0.0001. So that is quite significant. Uh, the, the next prognostic indicator will be the neck nodal metastasis, then the distant metastasis, the margin status and the preoperative facial nerve palsy. It has been found that if a patient has the preoperative facial palsy, then the rate of survival drops from almost 60% to 20%. So hence, it is a very bad prognostic factor. So coming to um, the experience that is uh, that we have in our institute, that is the Dr. B. Borva Cancer Institute, we have started the skull-based clinic since October 2017. And uh, among uh, 110 skull-based cases that we have seen in our clinic, 20 cases were uh, of the lateral skull base, and we have found a higher incidence in female. Almost 55% of the cases were of squamous cell histology, uh, but we also encountered other histologies like the adenoid cystic carcinomas, the mucopidomoid carcinomas, the basal cell carcinomas, etc. 65% of the total lateral skull based tumors were of temporal bone malignancies and six advanced parotid cancers and one scalp tumor. 60% were uh, could be treated with a curative intent. And among those 60%, 66% went ahead with surgery. Two were given definitive CTRT, one chemotherapy and one new adjuvant chemotherapy. Some case scenarios. Um, this is a case of a mucoepidermoid carcinoma of the parotid with ear canal involvement. So patient has undergone the wide excision, LTBR, and a superficial parodidectomy, sorry, total parodidectomy with a level 2 sampling because it was a clinical enzyronic. So this was the post-op picture with no facial palsy. So the second case is the squamous cell carcinoma of the ear canal, T2 disease. So we went ahead with a post auricular C incision and a ear canal incision. And this is the post picture. So this is a recurrent uh, adenoid cystic carcinoma with ITF involvement. Already undergone surgery somewhere else. We have found that uh, the, the foramen ovale was involved here. However, the histology being the adenoid cystic carcinoma, we went forward with the surgery and we found that the tumor could be removed easily. There was a plane uh, all around the tumor and it came out easily. So the histology is very important. Had it been a squamous cell carcinoma, we would have never gone forward with surgery with the tumor involving the foramen ovale. So this was a case of uh, basal cell carcinoma, temporal bone, sorry, scalp tumors. This is a preoperative picture, and this is the postoperative picture with a big reconstruction by a free flap. Squamous cell carcinoma of the temporal bone. When it, she came first to our OPD, we thought that it is a small tumor because it was just in the ear canal with no facial palsy. However, the imaging shows that there was already the tegmen erosion with intracranial extension and the histology being the squamous cell carcinoma, we did not go forward with surgery. 
So it is quite important to know the histology and whether it is worth resecting. So coming to the conclusion of today's presentation, skull based surgery necessitates learning unfamiliar surgical anatomy because the potential for disaster is great if we do not know the proper anatomy of this region. The treatment decision is dictated by the histology and the extent of the disease. Um, the, it's also very important as a surgeon to know when not to operate so as not to give the patient greater morbidity as well as uh, even mortality. And all said and done, skull based tumor management is very much a teamwork, and hence a dedicated team is necessary for the proper management of this rare group of tumors. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, it is it given a very good overall view of the skull, skull based malignancies, little skull based malignancies. Now we will unmute the participants. Uh, they can ask any questions if they wish to. Yes, yeah, sure. One question is there from Dr. Satyabrata Fukan, ma'am. Uh, the role of the frozen section. Role of frozen section, as I said, uh, usually nowadays in we do not go for end block resection. We go for a piecemeal resection. So when we sort of chase the disease with every tissue we remove, we send it for frozen section, and we keep on drilling the tumor until we find a negative margin. So frozen section is important. And also in advanced tumors, we if it is a clinically N0 neck, we send the level two for um, frozen section. In case it comes positive, then we have to do the full neck. As we had seen that the occult metastatic, nodal metastatic rate can be between 15 to 20%. Yes, ma'am. Uh, participants can ask questions if they wish to. They can unmute themselves. Dr. this is uh, Dr. Abhishek White here. Hi, sir. How are you? Yeah. Hi. I just wanted to uh, know a uh, wonderful presentation. Um, in the surgery section, you said that the, uh, the minimum uh, surgery for any uh, lateral temporal bone malignancy is LTPR. Uh, I would like to know your opinion on sleeve resections. Yeah, sleeve resection is, uh, is a surgical procedure that is uh, sometimes if there is a very uh, indolent tumor like a basal cell carcinoma maybe involving just the very anterior ear canal then sometimes maybe we can uh, only go for a sleeve resection uh, but uh, usually we do not find some such an indolent tumor there usually we find uh, squamous cell carcinomas that if it is a squamous cell carcinomas then you we have to go for an ltbr because we might uh, compromise the safety oncological safety of the uh, of, of the patient yeah so thank you very much in a very very indolent indolent histology thank you thank you sir. Uh, there is a question from dr kumar uh, in t1 n0 m0 any role of sleeve resection rather than ltbr yeah i just answered that question yes, if it is a very indolent histology and very very small disease then maybe yes but in all uh, possibilities, uh, we usually do not find uh, such a such a limited disease in a ear canal, and we have we have experience with indolent tumors like adenoid cystic carcinoma T1, where they have undergone sleep resection outside, but they come back with the disease. Maybe not immediately, maybe after one to two years, but they come back with the disease. So we usually prefer NTBR. Yes, the next question is from Dr. Palne Appan. Which flap you prefer commonly to repair the defect? In this? Uh, depends on the uh, on the extension. Usually, if the skin uh, is not involved, the soft tissue need not be uh, reconstructed. Then, just for filling up the temporal bone cavity, we use the temporalis muscle and uh, and thigh fat. Yes, uh, one second. Now. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Uh, people can unmute themselves. They can ask questions. Yeah, I am Dr. Prakash Munkar. Yes, sir. Uh, Dr. Kaveri, excellent crisp presentation. Uh, your slides were to the point, no, uh, uh, overcrowded, and it's uh, the way the most of the PT and young people should get it. Uh, just one Thank comment you. and uh, question also. Like in how many cases? transportation 
और सिलिंग ग्राफ्ट और समथिंग रिकंस्ट्रक्शन फेसियल Uh, if we can find the stump, if we have resect, if the facial nerve is not involved, and uh, or if it is involved, and we can uh, find the stump of the facial nerve, then we reconstruct. But the numbers are not many. We usually do not do it because finding the stump in the intratemporal region is very difficult. But if you can find it, then we do it. And by mobilizing the facial nerve, if you can see yes. the facial nerve and it is not involved and the tumor is there. you can transport the facial nerve mobilize it resect the tumor and then you can reconstruct it yeah yeah, yeah sure yeah, definitely series? hello have you done in your series uh, such cases no i have not transposition uh, transposition of the facial nerve i haven't done sorry okay. thank you excellent presentation thank you thank you hi right, ma'am uh, once again uh this question is from dr kumar which histology has a good prognosis or a poor prognosis sorry sorry i can't uh, what the question is which histology has a better or poor prognosis is asking which histology has a better and which histology has a poor prognosis poor prognosis <clears throat> yeah uh, squamous cell carcinomas are always considered to be an aggressive variant histology so uh, depending upon the uh, extension of the disease if it is a quite an extensive tumor then usually they carry a poor prognosis uh, good histologies will be like a basal cell carcinomas or an adenoid cystic carcinomas which have a better prognosis uh, the next question is from dr karthik can you give a brief background on the reconstruction after the after the total temporal bone resection brief sorry i didn't hear you uh, brief background on yes. the re reconstruction after the total temporal bone resection as i said total temporal bone resection was done earlier but it was quite morbid because we had seen in the discussion that it involves removing almost everything including from the internal carotid to the dura causing quite a quite a significant morbidity so nowadays that is not practiced at all ttbr is not done and because it is done in a very extensive disease anyhow those kind of um, advanced tumors do not carry a significant or a better a good survival that is why we actually do not contribute to the survival benefit but on the other hand we give a quite a significant morbidity to the patient that is why ttbrs are not done nowadays yes. the next question is from dr balakrishna kumar if we remove the tumor in piecemeal will it cause any seeding of the tumor or any post operative bleed no no because we after doing an ltbr then we chase the disease and do a piecemeal resection we keep on removing the tumor or the tissues we send for frozen and keep on drilling it does not cause bleeding it does not cause bleeding uh the next question is from dr kumar what is the usual dose of radiotherapy in t3 temporal bone squamous cell carcinoma after stbr the same as in other head and neck cancers almost 60 60 to 65 degree uh, grade is there any need to add on chemotherapy or when to need uh, when we can add on chemotherapy depending on the, the the indications of chemotherapy is almost similar to the other head and neck cancers but yes because we do a piecemeal resection um, if the piecemeal resection they keep on being positive and we keep on drilling then chemo adding chemotherapy uh, to the radiation might be a good idea uh, because uh, usually the skull based resections are gross tumor resection and not a wide excision so it might be a good idea to add chemotherapy but um, it is not in the in the in the guidelines and hence um, the indications of chemotherapy remains the same that is the positive margins and a uh, extra nodal spread of the neck nodes yes ma'am uh, dr pradmesh pai sir is saying something about the facial nerve reconstruction which prakash sir asked about yeah, i think I, you can I, read I, it I saw the message yeah you can read it once uh, then yeah that is that is right sir has rightly said ki we have to attempt for facial uh, nerve um reconstruction every time if it is possible that is right definitely uh next question so is we have question. a very good plastic surgery team also for that because uh, intertemporally sometimes it might be a uh, it might be uh, difficult to get these stumps and sometimes if it is not a very a uh, good plastic surgeon they might have a problem in um, in in reconstructing The next question is from Dr. Abhishek Vaidya. Even when piecemeal resection is required, the initial part will be almost always be LTBR. Is that yes, correct? Yes, yes, we yeah we do piecemeal after LTBR. 
than in T3, T4. So LTBR first and then we chase the disease. The next question is from Dr. Alok Mandal. How to manage the canal stenosis that occurs after two to three years? Canal stenosis, actually, we do a cul de sac closure in this kind of tumor. So there is no question of canal yes. stenosis. Yes. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Palnepan. Instead of TTBR, STBR with post op chemo radiation, is it preferable? Yeah, STBR, then we can uh, keep on chasing the disease because if we see a gross disease there, we cannot leave behind. So we chase the disease, we keep on resecting it piecemeal, send for frozen if possible or till we see a sort of healthy bone, we keep on drilling. And then as I said, chemotherapy, adding chemotherapy to post-op radiation is a good idea if we do a piecemeal resection. Yes, the next question is from Dr. Karthik. Is the management of CSF otorrhea in these cases is similar to any other case of CSF otorrhea? Sorry, I didn't get that question. Uh, management, management of, of CSF ah. otorrhea in ah. these cases is similar to any other case of CSF otorrhea or different? No, similar. Uh, CSF otorrhea is in because of the disease or because of the surgery? Maybe he's asking because of the surgery, I think. No, if Post we can, uh, if we can, if we can um, reconstruct the dura resection properly, there should not be any CSF otorrhea. The reconstruction of the dura is important. We cannot just resect and keep it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Prasnesh Pai, sir, is saying something. Piecemeal has been proven to be as good if not better than end-block resection. Chasing the disease after LTBR helps control the disease spread and at times conserve the facial nerve. Definitely. Next question is from Dr. Kumar. In T3N0, what type of paratectomy, a total or superficial, and what type of net dissection should be done? Uh, in T3 tumors, in a clinically N0 neck, in, and without any involvement of parotid, um, clinically or radiologically, um, as a margin, we treat a superficial parotid because it is considered to be a, a, a echelon node, first echelon node. And because it uh, comes in the same incision exposure, we also send the level two for sampling. So in a T3 N0 neck, we go for a, and without parotid involvement, we still go for a superficial parotidectomy and level two uh, sampling. Right now. Uh, if there are any questions, participant can, participants can ask ma'am. Ma'am, you can read the presentation first, sorry, I'm saying something. Uh, there can be some CSF leak with the opening of the cochlea or the semicircular canals also, and that can be sealed by bone bags. If the dura is resected, that can be re uh, reconstructed by the fascia. And if the cochlea or the semicircular canal is exposed and there is leak from there, that can be sealed by bone bags. To uh, prevent perineum giddiness post operative The next question is from Dr. Samir Pote. What are the common complications of LTBR? Common complications of LTBR are similar to other surgeries. There is no specific specific complication that can happen in LTBR. But yes, post facial nerve injury is always there because we go and um, special uh, special precaution has to be taken at the stylomestrate foramen because. At the stylomestrate foramen, the facial nerve becomes superficial. That's that there is always a risk of injuring it there. So, just the, just the general um, complications of surgery, not anything specific for LTBR. Uh, next question is from Dr. Anton Dev. Kindly repeat the indication for parotidectomy. If it is gross involvement of the parotid, then yes, we have to go for a total parotidectomy. And um, if there is no involvement of the parotid and it is a T3, T4 disease, then we go for a superficial parotidectomy. The next question is from Dr. Rajesh, Rakesh Kumar. Please repeat the name of the staging system. Modified um, Pittsburgh staging. It is already written by Dr. Abhishek. Abhishek. A modified Pittsburgh staging system. Right. Uh, if there are any questions, people can ask ma'am directly. They can unmute themselves. I think they don't have any questions. I think. Hello. 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 Hi. This is this is Ravi Shankar from SGPJ Lucknow. Hi. Uh, so when you will go for cul-de-sac closure? Uh, only in T3, T4, or uh, even T2 may you will go for a cul-de-sac closure. We usually do uh, cul-de-sac in all the cases. All the cases. So irrespective of uh, post-op RT. Yes. In yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
uh, i think there are no more questions ma'am i think we can close the session yeah thank, thank you ma'am thank you very much for this thank you Time. i think you have to end the meeting ma'am you are the host acha okay thank you welcome thank you thank you everyone